stories of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good Good father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you, it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. oh, and I've seen many searching for it. Good father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am, because you are perfect in all of your ways. can hardly speak and peace so unexplainable I, I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love Na te hā o te atua, i hanga i ēnei pango me mā onepū. Nā ngā matimati o te atua, i hanga i ēnei maunga, a i whakairo hoki i ēnei huanui kia pari ngā tai o ēnei awa. I hanga tia hoki te atua i tēnei whenua mō ngā tangata, he kai tiaki o tēnei whenua. For 136 years, we have travelled to the farthest corners of the world with the gospel in our hearts and our hands. With dedication and passion, we have obeyed the call to go out and make disciples of all nations. But alongside these stories of goodness, there have been stories of pain carved into our history. In our pursuit of the global unreached, we turned away from the people of this land, our Māori brothers and sisters. We walked apart and worked alone.
but there is a story of renewal that God wants us to tell. We learn from the past that the future may be different. God is chipping away the things not of himself and making something even more beautiful than before. As God is molding and shaping us, we are becoming sacred vessels of renewal carved by his hands. A new story of mission begins to unfold now, one that will be told together. And we turn back to the land, shoulder to shoulder, with our eyes fixed on Christ. Mehi koe tahi tātou, me mahi tahi tātou, poro tū tātaki i te whakahauna. Kia ora, great to be with you this morning and to be able to share a little bit about what's happening in our work globally as a bunch of Baptist churches and that you are supporting and a part of. This is part of our New Together series. Um, we changed the name from Prayer and Self Denial because Prayer and Self Denial had been around for 18 years. And as we talk to younger generations, the whole idea of denial and being called into God's mission had a real contrast effect in the sense of Called into God's mission, it's something we celebrate, we get out of, as well as others. And so, the less of the denial journey. We wanted to say, we talked about uh, the change of mission globally and what's happening since the pandemics. The reality is, there's been a whole lot of trends that have been functioning for a number of years, which have been fundamentally changing the face of global mission. And all the pandemic did was to pour fuel on those trends. The same trends are at work, but they've just been ignited and increased in pace because of the pandemic, which has principally been about changes in the West, as Western global workers, missionaries have been forced or chosen to come home, and the West has been less involved in financially giving. And leadership has passed, one way or another, to more local and indigenous leaders. Which many would say, hallelujah, that's fantastic, it's a good step forward, but it is fundamentally changing the face of uh, global mission. So we changed this, uh, this name. I've been in the role since March 2020, so I started on the 2nd of March 2020, and on the 23rd of March 2020, our Prime Minister decided to put our country into lockdown, uh, which created a bit of a storm because we had to choose uh, with our global team whether they came home or whether they stayed on the field, which was actually quite a massive decision for most of them because we couldn't promise they'd be able to get back for at least six months. So they really had to make difficult choices. So I've been in the job three weeks and had to make the most difficult choices for people um, since 1971 when there was the Pakistan-India war and the same decision had to be made for people. But in March this year, I managed to travel to Asia and to get back to this stunning part of the world, which I think is just so rich. An assault on the senses. It's um, stunningly beautiful, the saris and all the clothes that are worn are so bright and colourful and yet the poverty is so devastating and so in your face. The smells are wonderful, the smell of spice and spice stalls everywhere and then there's the smell of human waste right alongside it that is overpoweringly difficult to deal with. And there's the noise, it is constantly noise, it's just an assault on the senses but so good to be back there. And I went to one of the places that I had read about and heard about and thought about in this part of the world where we have been involved as New Zealand Baptists uh, for 88 years. In 1938, the Maharaja of this area allowed New Zealand Baptists to come in. It was the first time they were allowed to come in as a group and to preach the gospel in this particular state. And the Maharaja gave them 45 acres of land, which now the major capital city of that area is surrounded. And they're right smack in the middle of the city, sitting on 45 acres of prime real estate. The Maharaja who uh, gave this piece of land and get, gave the protection to the Kiwis who came, uh, built this palace in two years. So that is one third of the ground that spread up to the front of the palace and I've taken one shot of the side of the palace. Now, if we could achieve that kind of building construction in that kind of time frame in New Zealand now, 
it would be pretty impressive. These guys did it back then, 1938, um, in two years. So a very powerful situation. That church has grown phenomenally. 998 churches in that community, all whakapapering back to here and saying, New Zealand Baptists are those who started us. They are a home, they are our parents, they are our grandparents. And they, these are the ones we are grateful for in terms of starting this, this mission. Ironically, the number of churches in the period of COVID grew by 34. The number of baptised believers grew by 15,000. So whilst things were shut down, the faith has continued to grow at a phenomenal pace in this, this one community. Uh, and then if you look at the number of churches and you look at the number of pastors, some of you who do maths, Chris will be able to work this out very, very quickly uh, as a maths teacher. Uh, this is not one pastor per church. Far from it. Most of the pastors have three, four, five, six, seven, up to 13 churches under their care. And so it is a, a burgeoning work, but also a very, very significant work. I've crossed out the name on the top of this theological college, but at the heart of what's happening in this community is the theological college that trains its pastors and trains its evangelists. And that's spreading out right across the state and beyond the state into other states of the area. Uh, and this is, I think, the real jewel and the real gem, which Chris was praying for before in terms of the principal there, who we hope to have here in November, and the work that they do. Uh, they continue. So it was great to meet with the students there. You may be able to pick me in the crowd. Um, and to spend some time with, sorry, I need to get me back to this camera, and um, spend some time with the students and the staff. And I was there as they opened the first ever women's hostel, which is a really significant statement and supported by a number of Kiwis here financially and NZBBS. But it was a really um, strong statement of the place of women in the leadership of the church in this particular community. By building a hostel, it kind of says they have an ongoing role in the life of the leadership of that church. Uh, and it was a real celebration. Not without some conservative men in the front row as the place was opened, who didn't look as happy as others. But they're moving on. There is also a school inside this compound which has 3,000 students. Uh, the English medium is one of the highest uh, professionally competent schools in the area and they produce a lot of skilled people who go into all sorts of roles across that end of uh, the country. It was the second week back after 18 months of lockdown for these students and they were just so happy to be back. Uh, beaming smiles to see their friends, beaming smiles to be on playgrounds, to be back in the classrooms and, and to be part of what was going on. Uh, this is a hostel, which some of you may know about, and some of you have probably supported the boys' hostel. Uh, the, this is the old hostel uh, directly in front of us, and the man who looks after them, and a new hostel which is in the process of being built. The bottom floor and second floor are now being used by the boys, and the top floor is still being constructed internally and put to good use. I sat down with these, a group of pastors there, who had all been in their roles for five plus years, looking after three, four, five, six, seven churches, and asked them about what they would want me to ask New Zealanders to pray for them. And this is what they said. Thank you for praying for us still today. It was the first thing that came out of this group of 20 odd uh, people there. Thank you for the ongoing relationship. Thank you for the ongoing concern. It's ironic that people in the Southwest Pacific have got a commitment to the northeast of this country, thousands of miles away, and yet God has united us yeah. and brought us together. So they, so they appreciate your prayer. We are fighting for our survival to sustain the gospel. We are systematically, socially, financially, administratively, and religiously harassed. And when they told the stories about how the government and the communities and the villages harass them, it's very, very clear that this is happening. As Christians, we are targeted people. We serve people and become enemies of the people because of our service. We are reaching more people with the word of God and long to reach many more. Our pastors are fully committed. One pastor will typically look after five to seven churches. Pray for unity among ourselves. There are many tongues in different tribes. And pray for our political leaders, most of whom are not Christians. And I forgot to take a word out, but I won't read that one. 
Just take a moment. Choose one of those. Just for a moment. Choose one of those prayer requests from these people. And please pray. Amen. So renew together. About us being renewed here and being involved in the renewal of others globally. And because they're being renewed by the Spirit of God, their stories and their witness helps to renew us again. So it's a relationship of give and take, uh, teaching and learning, serving and leading, both ways. That, I believe, is the future of mission in the world. Yeah as each community has much to give and much to receive. And I think that's the vision of the revelation, when all nations come together before God and are united in maturity of faith and unity. And because of that, we're on a journey of being renewed as a mission yeah. and a new focus going forward. Um, one of the first jobs was to create a strategy for the next few years, which we've done. It's online. James can download it for you if you want it. And part of that strategy is to look at who we are and how we're known in New Zealand. I want to let you into a secret that most people don't know yet and won't know until November. But we are called by people around our churches as NZBMS, as Transend, as MPIL, Marketplaces, as Banzade, as Mission World. We have BMF groups. And to be honest, I go to churches and people introduce me as all sorts of things. Most people mix up the initials or call us by something else. The most common name is Transend, probably, for many New Zealanders. But in the world we live in today, Transend, when you pick up the phone, has confusing connotations for many people when we're talking about a transgender world and all that's going on. So we figured that's not a name we can use going forward. So we spent some time as we're looking into the future and saying, we, we, we need one name, just one name, that captures who we are and what we will do in the future. And as we talk about mission that is about giving and receiving, we're talking about focusing on one thing together, being focused on gospel renewal and our lives and the lives of those we serve and we learn from. So we were looking for, for a simple word that would um, sum that up. And we ended up with a Māori word, which is aratahi. So from November, don't tell anybody, but from November <coughs> at the Hui, we're going to launch our name going forward as aratahi. Are people who are focused together on one thing, the mission of God. So if you hear anything about that story, please tell people it's a good story. People don't like change. And I know that. But we need to move forward and put a stake in the ground for the future of the upcoming generations. And Kiwis don't always like a change to a Māori name. So please help us. Let people know we're doing this to position ourselves for the future and to claim that we're a mission together with one focus, with, with one direction. And that's God's gospel renewal. I want to tell a story today that you know really, really well. It's from John chapter 4, and it's when Jesus is traveling from Judea and he's going back to Galilee. And geographically, the smart thing to do is get, go straight through the middle. But theologically and culturally, that is the really inappropriate thing to do. Because if he goes on the direct route, he has to pass through Samaria. <coughs> and Samaritans and Jewish people hated each other. So Jesus takes the direct route, but the culturally, theologically inappropriate route. He takes the road less traveled. And if, as he goes through Samaria, you need to know a few things about the view that Jews had of Samaritans. They thought of them as schismatics, as heretics, as mongrels, and in this last case, uh, perhaps a morally suspect person that he meets. Let me unpack that for you. Schismatics are those who pull apart. And what the Samaritans had done is they said, we don't worship in the temple in Jerusalem, we worship in a different temple. So they had pulled the faith apart. They were heretics because they didn't believe the full faith that the Jews believed. They only believed in the first five books of the Old Testament. And so they were heretical. And they were considered, which is a really tough word in today's society, but that's how they were considered as mongrels, because they had intermarried. And racially, ethnically, the Jews saw that as a negative. And so Jesus is travelling through this space, 
and he meets a woman by a well. You know the story in John chapter 4. And he's thirsty. And he starts a conversation with her. And at every level, that conversation is the wrong thing for him to be doing. As a Jewish man, he should not be initiating a conversation with a woman. As a Jewish man, he should not be engaging with a woman in public. As a um, Jewish man, he should not be speaking with a Samaritan or asking a Samaritan for help. And as a rabbi, he would look down on her as a woman, he would look down on her as a Samaritan, and Jesus doesn't care about any of those cultural boundaries. He crosses over all of them in order to engage with this woman with respect, with compassion, and with concern for her. And in this particular encounter, we read what happens in John 4. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. Let me say something about the well, the water, and the woman. So we got ourselves on the same page. Firstly, the well. This well was well known. Did you like that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this well is still there. One of the great things about wells is they don't move. So if you travel to Israel now, you can still see this well. It's 22 meters deep, and the water is still clean and cool. It's there. And it had been reliable for many centuries before the time that Jesus meets this woman. And for both Samaritans and Jews, their backstory scripturally tells them that God often has important encounters near a well. So Abraham's servant meets Rebecca in Genesis 24. Rachel and uh, Jacob meet in Genesis 29. Uh, Moses and seven daughters of the priest meet in Exodus 2. Both of them would have known that wells are significant places for encounters about faith and God. And here around this well, almost like the school gate of today, people met and talked. And this was an important encounter that was about to happen. And secondly, the water. I mean, obviously the water in the Middle East is precious. It is the essence of life in a dry and hostile environment. And water was really important for Jesus as well. Jesus is baptised in water. His first uh, miracle is turning water into wine. In John chapter 7 and verse 37, he says he is the living water. He calls himself living water. In Revelation 22 and verse 1, it talks about Jesus being a life-giving river. Water is this powerful image. Of course it's needed for human life, and of course Jesus was thirsty. But there's another layer of insignificance here. About the importance of water for the spirit and for life. Uh, of faith. And the third let me say something about the woman. Yes, she was a Samaritan, but other than that, we know very little about her. Only one personal detail. We don't know her name. We don't know her age. We don't know anything about her, really. And that's quite different from the previous chapter, chapter 3 of John, where Jesus meets Nicodemus. We're told he's a religious leader, and we know some more about his story. And they meet in the dead of night. But with this woman, Jesus meets in the brightness of the day and we know so little. The only personal detail we know is that she has had five husbands and the man she's living with now is not her husband. And that comes up in the conversation that the two of them are having around this well. And normally people make assertions about her morality about that, which may or may not be true. The reality was, sadly, in that culture at that time, that woman was seen as property. 
They were first the property of their father, and at marriage they became the property of their husband. I'm not advocating for anything but, but it's the real historical reality. And this woman was married. And once married, men had tremendous rights to divorce, far more than the rights of women. If tea wasn't cooked well, that was a grounds for divorce. And sadly, this woman became divorced. We don't know why. But having been divorced, her survival depends on marriage, or selling herself on the streets, or something similar. And she gets married a second time. And maybe the same thing happens and she gets divorced again. But having been married twice and divorced twice, your options are reduced. You're only left with the dodgy or the doddery as options for husbands. Sadly for her, it happens again and again. Maybe it was her fault, maybe it wasn't. But she was in a precarious situation. And now the man she's living with isn't even prepared to marry her, but just lives with her. Maybe she is more or less suspect. Maybe she's just a person of bad fortune. And Jesus meets her and talks with her. Well, what did they talk about? Remarkably, this is the longest passage of any conversation that Jesus had with anybody that we have in Scripture. It's with this woman. It fills up a lot of John 4. Far longer than any other conversation. And it's the first time in John's Gospel that Jesus declares who he really is to anybody before Pilate at his trial. They have a real conversation. Yes, it's about water, and it's about the well. She, as Tangata Whenua, describes to him as Mana Heere coming into her area how things operate here, because he doesn't seem to know how Jews and Samaritans should, should be with each other. She describes the Dekana. She describes her Whakapapa, and describes how she Whakapapa's back to Jacob, who dug this well. She speaks to him in a culturally appropriate way. And then they move on to speak about faith. They talk about worship. They talk about who is the right some, um, Messiah. What is the outcome? In this relationship, this conversation, the outcome is remarkable. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. She goes back into town, calls the others out. And he stayed two days, and because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the saviour of the world. That's remarkable. A change in a whole community. After two days, he left the Galilee. So Jesus stays with them for a period of time. What can we learn? Well, a lot. A respectful relationship. A crossing of ethnic and cultural boundaries to treat somebody with respect and compassion and open conversation where no one else would have done that. And Jesus doesn't ask you to become a Jew. He doesn't ask the Samaritans to go and worship in Jerusalem. He lets them be Samaritans. Samaritans who now know the Saviour, the Messiah, and worship the Messiah, Jesus, in a Samaritan way, through a Samaritan lens. This is remarkable. And it's right there in Scripture. And Jesus spoke about Samaritans positively. He told a story about a man who was good, and he was compassionate, and he was caring. And he called him a good Samaritan, which is problematic at every level. In Luke 17, I think, Jesus talks about ten lepers who are healed, and only one comes back to say thank you, and he reminds the disciples that one's a Samaritan. Whatever people we look down on, what we see is different to us. This passage invites us to engage in respectful relationship. With honest sharing. And real concern. And in the midst of that, God is at work. That's why Renew Together is really important. Let me tell you a story to finish. 
It's about one of the changes we feel we need to make going forward. It's one of the things we will get into trouble for. In 1882, and no one here was here then, so I'm not blaming anybody. <laughs> In 1882, New Zealand Baptist, New Zealand Baptist Missionary Society had a work with Māori. It was in the Rotorua area, and it was mainly to do to, with help to stop the effects of alcohol in Māori communities. In 1885, NZBMS was set up. In 1888, they came back together and had another meeting. Up to 1888, money was raised in the churches through cardboard mission boxes. And people were encouraged to put their money in the mission box. All the mission boxes were brought together, and that was how NZBMS was funded. And the money in the mission boxes went in two parts, 50% to Māori Mission, 50% to India. In 1888, when they had a meeting of New Zealand NZBMS, they decided, after conversation, that Māori are a dying race. There is no future in supporting a work with Māori. And India is the future of the world. So all our money will go to India. And no money will go to Māori. At the same time, the man who was in charge of the mission work with Māori, the Māori leaders came to NZBS and said, this man is disrespectful and insulting to us. Have him back. And it stopped. From 1888 to 1948, we did nothing to speak up for Māori or to be engaged in Māori mission. In February 2020, we apologised to our Māori leaders. Took a letter, we gave it to the Māori leaders over a day and apologised. It was a room full of tears. But we can't just apologise. Repentance calls us to say sorry, but it also calls us to change what we do. And so one of the things we will do going forward is have some engagement with Māori Mission and try and be supporters going forward for some piece of significant Māori Mission. So we'll always do global. We'll always do India. I hope, I pray. We'll always do Bangladesh. We're involved in other places as well. I'm being a bit careful now, realizing there's a camera here. Um, but one of the things we see it's God calling us to do is to repair the past and engage to some level with Māori. As Jesus did with this woman, Samaritans and Jews did not look well at each other. But Jesus crossed the boundaries. He treated this woman with respect and with compassion. He talked about God and faith and worship and the living water of life. And she and her community came to know that Jesus is the Messiah. And that's what we want to see all over the world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your model to us. Thank you that you are the living water for each one of us. Help us to learn from the way you interact with people. And help us to be bearers of your living water wherever we are.